My name is Renata. I'm a graduate student at the University of Minnesota, and I work with Dr. Molly Spivak. Uh, and for my PhD research, I have been, uh, before I start, can you all hear me well, I, I guess? Okay. So for my PhD research, I'm studying the honeybee's natural defense mechanism. I'm studying bee health. But, so more specifically, their natural behavior mechanism. And that means both the individual immune system and also the collective immune system. And by collective immune system, I mean their behavior they perform to protect the colony uh, against pathogens and parasites. And like I said, you're all beekeepers, so I'm sure you all have seen many diseases. You have seen a colony that needed to be treated. And if you couldn't treat, unfortunately, I think you have seen your colony die. And this happens because uh, the colony, the honeybee colony, is a very uh, cluster society with highly rela related individuals. And that makes a good and favorable habitat for a wide range of pathogens and parasites. And with that, we have um, varroa mites, uh, a bee parasite. We have nosema. We have many viruses. Uh, and the list just goes on and on and on. And it's just too many. And people sometimes ask, how can they deal with all that? How do they defend themselves? How do they defend the colony? Um, and when we talk about the defense mechanism, uh, like I said, we have the individual and we have the colony level. So I've introduced both of them separately. At the individual level, we have the individual immunity. Just, just, we have the individual immunity. It's very similar, quite similar to, the, to humans. So I'll make sometimes this analogy um, here and there. Just to make it simple, it makes it simple for me sometimes to understand how the immune system works. But it's quite similar to the human immune system. So they have the cellular immunity and the humoral immunity. With the cellular immunity, they have a, it's a very simple immunity. And it's more like the blood cells, the encapsulation and engulfment of pathogens. And then the humor immunity, it's not as uh, similar to, to humans. Humans, they synthesize antibodies. Honeybees do not synthesize antibodies. It's much simpler. Their humor immunity, they synthesize antimicrobial compounds. And how do they synthesize antimicrobial compounds? If you think of the DNA as a cooking book, for example, uh, it has all the recipes, with all the recipes for all the genes that the bee need to, pr to produce, to synthesize. So they have all the recipes for all the antimicrobial peptides they need to synthesize. So whenever the bee needs to synthesize a antimicrobial peptide, it will send the, just the recipe to produce that antimicrobial peptide to the ribosome, which is the machinery that will produce the protein right here. So it sends that recipe, that message to the ribosome. The ribosome translates the message and produces the protein. And that message, that recipe is the messenger RNA. Uh, when we want to assess the immune system activity, we assess the number of copies of messenger RNA for whatever gene we want, uh, we're interested. For example, if you're interested in the immune system activity, we want to measure messenger RNAs for immune genes. So if they need to produce 10 uh, immune genes, they'll send 10 copies. So we can measure the number of copies and compare between two bees. So if these bees, this bee here has 1,000 copies for one immune gene and these bees ha has only 10 copies, it means something. It means that the, this bee here needed to produce that many because maybe it was under stress, under, infect, under infection. So we can compare the immune system activity that way just with the uh, measuring RNA copies. And that's how I usually measure the immune system activity. And you'll be seeing graphs like this. So this bar here represents one colony, for example. And there's less copies of the messenger RNA for an immune gene. So it means that, that this colony here, the immune system of those bees was quieter. So they did not have to produce as many messenger RNAs. They did not have to activate their immune system as much. And as a result, we may conclude they were healthier. And sometimes the graph will be flipped, so I have the trend lines to make it easier. 
so you know which one was higher, which one was lower. And we have the colony level. So at the colony level, individual bees will perform behaviors that protect the colony and will protect themselves too from an infection, from a pathogen or a parasite. And as an, as an example, we have hygienic behavior. If you haven't heard of hygienic behavior, um, it's a behavior that's performed by a few individual bees in a hive. And these bees, they can detect that there's an infected larvae in the colony. They will detect that that, that larvae is infected and we will remove that larvae from the colony before it becomes infectious, before the disease creates these spores and is spread to the hive. So it protects the colony from an infection. So that's the hygienic behavior. And another example is grooming. Uh, some bees will groom off, for example, varroa mites from an estimate, and that's an example of a colony level immunity because they protect the colony from the spread of varroa mites. And the third one that I'll be talking more during this, uh, this talk is the collection of plant resins. So the collection of plant resins is part of their social immunity. And why is that? It's because resins, they have antimicrobial compounds. So resins are synthesized by plants, by trees mostly, and that's part of their uh, defense mechanism, of the plant defense mechanism. They synthesize resin to protect themselves from their own pathogens and parasites. The, in the resin has uh, a lot of antimicrobial compounds. And many insects, not only bees, they will collect resin from trees and they use from their own, for their own benefit. So bees do that, they collect resin from plants and they bring to the hive for their own benefit. They do this by uh, scraping uh, the resin from the tree with their mandibles. So they use the mandibles to take the resin and they transport back to the hive on their hind legs, uh, just like they transport pollen. Sometimes it can be mistaken by pollen when they come back to the hive. The difference is that resin it's not uh, shaped as a ball like pollen. It's more a irregular shape and it's shinier. When they come back to the, re to the colony with the resin load on the hind leg, they'll need the help of another uh, worker bee, another nest mate, to unload that resin from the hind legs. Uh, the resin's very sticky, so they cannot unload that themselves. They usually need the help of another worker bee. Another worker bee using their mandibles We'll take the resin from their hind legs and we'll deposit immediately, uh, usually on the wall of the colony. For example, here you have a picture of a tree cavity. So it's the inside, it was the colony that was nesting in a tree cavity. And uh, you can see that the colony was just right here. And all this is propolis that they deposit. So propolis is resin. When they bring back to the colony, we call it propolis. But it's basically the same thing. Uh, the only difference is that bees tend to add wax to the resin just to make easier to work with. Resin is very sticky, so they will add a little bit of wax to make easier for them. But it's basically the same thing. So they will deposit the propolis on the walls of the, the, the interior of their nest. So they will coat, they make this layer of propolis and coat the entire nest where, where they're living. So for example, here, you don't see any propolis because the nest is not up there. Uh, so they will coat the entire nest with propolis and we call it the propolis envelope just because it's this layer, antimicrobial layer that surrounds the colony. And you can see here again, it's the same tree. Uh, and it's just a picture from the interior looking at the entrance, and you can see more uh, this envelope, as I'm saying, this brown color. That's the, the propolis, the tree itself is not as dark. As you can see, it's lighter. So it's making that propolis envelope. And unfortunately, they do not make this propolis envelope in a commercial hive, uh, in man-made boxes. And we think it could be because of the surface is too smooth of the, the commercial hives and the tree cavity is rough and that uh, triggers them to deposit propolis and make it smooth. Um, but we at the university, we have come up with a technique, a method that is stimulate them to create that propolis envelope in a colony, in a commercial hive. 
using propolis straps. Uh, those are commercially available propolis straps you can find anywhere. We just cut them to the right length and width of the box and we staple to the, to the inside of the, the box to create that rough surface that triggers them to deposit propolis. See that goes around the whole side? Yes, on, it, on the inside. But just on one side? Oh, no, no, on the, all the four sides, yes, all the four. And you can see here, that was at the end of the experiment, they had created that propolis envelope. So all the, all these uh, lines, the brown reddish lines, those are propolis that they deposit uh, inside of the gaps of the propolis straps. So we, we got them to, uh, to, to create, to construct this propolis envelope in uh, commercial hives. And we found that it was a, con we found a constitutive benefit to the, to the immune system. There was a both direct and indirect benefit. And I'll be uh, talking more about this experiment tomorrow, but I'll give just a summary of what we found. We found there was a direct benefit to the immune system because it decreased the baseline expression of immune genes. What do I mean by this? It decreased uh, the expression of the, we didn't find as many uh, messenger RNAs for immune genes in colonies that had the propolis envelope compared to colonies that did not have the propolis envelope. So the immune system was quieter compared to the ones that did not have the propolis envelope. And there was also an indirect benefit that it decreased overall bacterial load in the colony and that resulted on the same thing, a decrease on the immune genes being expressed because it decreased the need for those immune genes to be synthesized because you do not have as many bacteria in the colony. So there was a direct and an indirect. And why, why is it good to have a quieter immune system? Uh, because similar to humans, the immune system requires a lot of energy to function, to be active. When we are sick and we are synthesizing a lot of antibodies, we feel, we feel kind of weak. We feel that we're not as active. We don't feel like staying at home and staying in bed. We are weak because that requires a lot of energy from our body to fight an infection. And that's the same thing with bees. It requires a lot of energy for them to fight an infection, to synthesize those immune genes. And if they don't have to use all their energy to maintain uh, an active immune system, they can use that energy for something else, to perform any other behavior they, they need in the colony. And we also found, in another research, we also found that there was a therapeutic uh, benefit to the colony when they had the propolis envelope. When we challenged them with a fungal pathogen, uh, Ascosphere apis is the name of the fungal pathogen that caused chalk brood, it's a brood disease, we found that colonies that had the propolis envelope had lower level of that infection compared to colonies that did not have the propolis envelope. So they were both challenged the same way, but the colonies that had the propolis envelope did not show as many uh, level, as high level of infection compared to the ones that did not have. It was, uh, oh, I should have the results here. This was Mike Simone uh, res uh, research he published in 2012, plus one. Uh, I, would, I would say it could be a difference of 10 cells. He counted the number of cells. That ha that's how he measured the level of infection. He counted the number of cells that had symptoms of chalk brood. Uh, and if I'm not wrong, the difference was like 10 cells. One was 20, the other one was maybe eight or 10. I have to double check uh, who asked. I can, okay, I can double check maybe later and tell you. I, I wasn't the exact numbers, but like is it a 5% increase? Uh, improvement? Well, in that case, it would be a 50%, yes. But it's, it, so it, it will not cure. It's not a solution. It's not a, a medication. It's just we're trying to understand how they defend the colony naturally. So it's not something that, it, you would have to cure your colony and they won't have any disease. And for my research that I was showing later, it didn't cure, it was, didn't bring down to zero either. It just helped, was part of their defense mechanism. So we're just trying to understand how they defend, 
but it's not a way that we're trying to say it makes them resistant to a disease. Uh, so this is a chakra is a brood disease, and we were interested in the therapeutic benefit of the propolis envelope in a bacterial pathogen, a bacterial disease, uh, into both colony level and individual level. Because with the chalk brood, he only looked at the colony level, so the infection rate. And we wanted to understand also at the individual level what go, what's going on. Uh, so we measured the individual level and colony level and how that affected uh, the colony. And we used uh, the agent for uh, AFB, the bacterial agent that causes AFB, American fowl brood, uh, which is Benibacillus larvae. And it's also a brood disease. Uh, AFB is a brood disease, it affects only the brood. It does not, it cannot kill the adult. The adult can carry the spores, but it does not die from AFB. They're resistant. Uh, AFB can only kill one, two, sometimes three day old larvae. After that, when they're older than two, three day old, they're um, resistant to the disease. They can still ingest the spores, but they will not show any symptoms. They will not die from AFB. So that is the only susceptible stage. Uh, they can contract AFB via oral intake of the spores from contaminated larval food. And that can happen either because the nurse bee's uh, head was transmitting the spores, so the nurse bee had the spores on their mouth parts, and while feeding, it just uh, fed with, uh, contaminated the food with spores. And it can also happen uh, if there was a larvae that died in that same cell from AFB, those spores will stay in that cell, and the next bee will just uh, have that spores in the food, and will ingest, and it will get sick, and it will die from AFB. There is one mechanism uh, of, resistant, of resistance to AFB that is thought to uh, be because they have a high antimicrobial larval food. When they're at that young stage, one to two day old bees, they are fed royal jelly. It's very high in antimicrobial compounds and it's thought that one mechanism of their resistance to AFB, some colonies, uh, some lines of bees, they call it resistant to AFBs, and it's thought to be because they have these high antimicrobial activity food, larval food. So we, for this research, we collected uh, their larval food, and we tested the antimicrobial activity of this larval food when they had the propolis envelope and when they did not have a propolis envelope in the colony. And we collected nurse age bees to assess their immune system activity. Um, and I will explain why we collected nurse age bees and the connection with uh, maybe the defense mechanism through the nurse bees. And we also, at the colony level, we assess the level of infection. So we, in the field, we count the number of cells that had died from AFB, the number of larvae that died from AFB. And it's a little, uh, it's quite easy in the field to detect and much easier in the lab using molecular techniques to detect if the larvae died from AFB. Uh, if the larvae just died from AFB and it's kind of fresh, you can see this uh, gooey kind of rumpy brood and you can stick uh, a match, kind of stir and pull up and you will see this line uh, kind of gooey and it's dark to uh, medium brown color. If it's not fresh, if it's already dried, the larvae will look like this. Uh, we call it dried scale, and it's on the bottom of the cell. So we, can, we counted both uh, types, either fresh or dried, and we counted uh, approximately every 10 days, and that's how we measured the level of infection. We had colonies with the propolis straps using the same technique as I mentioned before. Uh, to uh, stimulate them to create a propolis envelope. And we challenged half of them with AFB. And the other half was unchallenged and used to compare. Uh, we had colonies without the propolis envelope. We also challenged half of them and the other half we used to compare. And the larval food antimicrobial activity, how do we measure antimicrobial activity? We collected the larval food and we put it, in, put it in a plate that contained the P-larvae spores, the, the bacterial spores that cause AFB. 
and we let that grow, that, that bacteria grow in that plate with the larva of food for two days. And at the end, we measure how much, how many spore was in that plate. If there was a lot of spores, like here you see a lot of uh, white dots more than here, if there was a lot of spores, the larval food wasn't really, uh, didn't have a high antimicrobial activity compared to this one, for example, that did not, as many, did not have, have as many spores growing. So if, if inhibited the growth of that spore more than on this case, for example. And I'll be showing with grass, graphs like this. So if the bar is high, it means there was a lot of spores, bacteria spores. So it means that the food was not as good as inhibiting the growth of that bacteria compared to this one, for example, was lower. So it would be maybe something like this. There was less spores growing, so the larval food was keeping this bacteria from growing from growing. And we saw something very interesting, that colonies that had a propolis envelope did have larval food with higher antimicrobial activity. Um, and this was independent of the, the presence or absence of the challenge. They had, the larval food was higher in antimicrobial activity compared to colonies that did not have the propolis envelope. And we also uh, were asking, well, why is that? What, what could be in that larva food that it, it's, it, it, it is different than the other colonies that does not have the propolis envelope? Uh, resin has volatile compounds, and those volatile compounds um, are antimicrobial compounds. So even though the propolis envelope is not touching the larva food, those volatile compounds can be in the larva food. Uh, this is what we think. We don't know. We don't know the mode of action yet. It's just something, a hypothesis of uh, why we are seeing this result. So it's possible the volatiles from the propolis envelope are in the larval food. And uh, more interesting, or as interesting, colonies that have AFB uh, did also have larval food that had higher antimicrobial activity. So in the past, uh, maybe one of the first papers is studying the defense mechanism of bees, the d resistant, resistance mechanisms to AFB. They, hyp they hypothesize that maybe nurse bees add something to the food. They, tend, they can detect the presence of the disease in the colony, and they will add something to the larval food that will uh, protect the brood. And this is the same with hygienic behavior. Some bees can detect the presence of uh, a disease in a colony. And so they hypothesize that idea that some bees can detect the presence and they will add something to the larval food that will make um, them resistant or will just protect them from AFB. And one of the things that they can add to the food that was hypothesized as well, nothing that has been proven, is uh, antimicrobial peptides. So they synthesize these antimicrobial peptides and it's possible that they can add that to larval food that will protect the brood. And so that's why we measure the uh, immune system activity. And we uh, saw that bees, nurse age bees from propolis envelope colonies, they had a higher immune system activity. They, were, they, they had a stronger immune system they were able to mount a stronger immune response when they were challenged uh, with the AFB compared to colonies that did not have the propolis envelope. So you can see here is higher. Those are the propolis envelope colonies in red. Uh, not for this gene. They were dissimilar. But these two are uh, immune genes, antimicrobial peptides. And colonies from the propolis envelope just were producing more of those two, at least those two antimicrobial peptides compared to colonies that do not have the propolis envelope. So this is just one. We don't know why, because we did not measure uh, the amount of those two antimicrobial peptides in larval food, but we think it could be one way uh, that larval food is higher in antimicrobial activity, is that the bees are producing these antimicrobial peptides at higher rate and maybe uh, protecting the brood that way. And we, at the colony level, we found that in August and in September, so we measured every like 10, 15 days. In August and in September, 
we did not see any difference, although there was a trend that colonies that had the propolis envelope had lower level of infection, but they were not different, uh, statistically different. But in October, two months after the infection, they had significantly less uh, level of infection compared to the colonies that did not have a propolis envelope. So at the colony level, we did see uh, a good result two months after. So it did not completely uh, um, cure the colony. So you see it's not zero, uh, but it did have less. This is a sever severity score, so those are not uh, single cells. The way we measure uh, AFB infection is after 25 cells that are infected with AFB, we stop counting and we call that the three, the level three score. So this one had almost the highest level of three, and this one had about a 1.7 uh, level. But there, were, there was uh, significantly less uh, cells that died from AFB in colonies that have the propolis envelope. So in summary, what we saw, what we, we, can, we, we, we can understand from this, we, what we understood from this experiment is that the propolis envelope, they served as kind of an external uh, immune system to the bees, an external antimicrobial layer to the colony that protected the brood and also uh, allowed the bees, the nurse bees, to invest on the immune system and mount a strong immune response with a result of a lower level of infection at the colony level. Um, and you may ask how the propolis envelope uh, can have the ability to let these nurse bees to just mount a stronger immune response. Um, one of the theory in theories, we just we don't have all the answers, but one of the theories is that when they don't need to synthesize antimicrobial peptides, they just can save more energy. So we talked before about the constitutive benefit of the propolis envelope when they're just, they're not challenged just in a regular colony. They have a lower immune system activity. So they can say they're saving that energy. And we think that because they can save energy when they don't need, they can mount a strong immune response when they need to. So this is just theories. Um, but it, it, it proved to be part, an uh, important part of the immune of the, the social immunity, an important part of the social system. That's how they defend the colony in the wild, at least. And we were interested when we saw those results that seemed to be so, so important for them, the presence of a propolis envelope. We asked ourselves, well, do bees collect more resin when they are sick? Uh, do they self-medicate? So when we are sick, we can go to the pharmacy and get more medication. Uh, when bees are sick, do they go out and collect more resin? Uh, and we tested that. And we also tested uh, if they collect for a specific source. Uh, resins can have from different plants. We have different composition, different antimicrobial activity. So we ask ourselves the same the question also, do, will they uh, select for a type of resin? In uh, 2009, Mike Simone, he started uh, this self-medication using chalk brood as a pathogen. Uh, so he challenged the colonies with chalk brood with a fungal pathogen and observed if they collected more resin at the end after the challenge. And yes, they did. They collected more resin after chalk brood pathogen compared to colonies that were not challenged. So he had a set of colonies that he did not challenge and a set of colonies that he challenged with uh, chalk brood, and he compared how much the colonies that uh, were challenged with uh, chalk brood were collecting resin, and they did increase. So we tested the same question, the same idea with uh, American fall brood, the bacterial pathogen. We challenged the colonies uh, with American fall brood, and we observed um, the resin foraging activity. So we did the same uh, design that uh, Mike Simone did. We closed the colonies, we plugged the colonies for 15 minutes, and we observe uh, the returning foragers for 15 minutes. And the ones that come with resin, we cage in a queen cage uh, until we are done observing, and then we are done, we count how many we collected, and we release them. 
And we do this uh, before we challenge them and after we challenge them. So we can do a comparison, say that it increased or it stayed the same uh, compared to when they were not challenged. And what we saw is that they do increase for American fall brood as well. Uh, we repeated this for three years uh, and we compared with colonies that were not challenged and we saw an increase of resin foraging after uh, they were challenged with American fall brood. So uh, this also supports Mike Simone research that yes, bees seem to self-medicate to collect more resin when they're sick. And we saw that they're collecting different types of resin, uh, both before they were challenged and after they were challenged. So that's why we asked the question, do they select for a single type of resin or do they select for a wide range of resin? And okay, and we did this the same way and after, uh, after we captured the bees with resin, we uh, took the resin and we collected the resin from the hind legs with a, a pin and uh, took to the lab, individually assessed the botanical source, the composition of that resin. So the fingerprints, like a digital, every resin has a fingerprint and we can tell if that resin is uh, from, let's say, Populus detoides or Balsamifera or a hybrid, or from a Populus hybrid. We run this in a machine called LCMS, is a liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, and basically reads the, the digital of that resin. And we compare with the digital of the tree resin collected from the tree. So we can compare those two and tell, okay, this one is the same, and they have specific markers. So for example, these are this, the specific markers for this tree, so we can tell, okay, this resin comes from detoides, and, and this resin here comes from balsamifera, and we can count uh, the number of resin that come from one botanical source or for the other, and assess if they can select or not. Um, we did notice they had more resins collected from Populus detoides, uh, and they increased uh, from five to 60 for more from Populus detoides compared to all the other botanical source. So our question after that was, well, why did they collect more from Populus detoides? Was it because it had a higher antimicrobial activity or was it because it was just more abundant and there was more and that's why they collected it. So we are testing right now that uh, the resins, all the botanical sources for antimicrobial activity using the same uh, method as I explained for the larval food. And uh, so we're doing this assay to see if they have more antimicrobial activity, to see if that was the reason why maybe they collected more of it. We're also doing assessments uh, going in a straight line for two miles, which is their flight range, and doing sections and try, uh, doing assessments of how many uh, trees they have in the, their flight range. So we can tell if it was because it was abundant or not. Um, but you have to stay tuned. <laughs> that, that's, uh, uh, that's gonna take a while. Uh, I would say maybe a couple of months until we finish all the, the botanical source assessments in the, the two miles range and all the antimicrobial activity. But, just the fact that they self-medicate and it supports not just one year study, it was three years and we saw the same trend every year, that they do self-medicate when they're challenged with a bacterial pathogen. Also supports other research that have done this with a fungal pathogen that yes, they do self-medicate. Honeybees are very resilient. They're not as weak as many people may think. They're strong and they can defend themselves, they can defend the colony just fine. Um, honeybees have been here for many, many, many years and they can, they can be on their own. Uh, we just have sometimes to uh, understand how they, they behave naturally, their natural behavior, and try to accommodate this uh, in the commercial setting. Uh, they, they do not live in commercial boxes naturally. 
So if we can understand how they do in the wild and try to accommodate that in our uh, commercial setting, I think would be nice. We will just uh, help them and maybe improve their health. And with that, I'll have questions if you have questions, but thank you. Thank you. Does the microbial activity strength change over time? That's a good question. Uh, for the larval food, we measured, I'm sorry, read the question? Okay, he asked if the um, antimicrobial activity changes over time. Uh, are you talking about the antimicrobial activity of the, the resin or the, the food, the larval food? Of the propolis. Of the propolis, okay. Um, I will be talking about this tomorrow, and yes, we, I do think we have proof that it changes over time and uh, we measured their, uh, the propolis antimicrobial activity in October and in May because they stopped uh, foraging, of course, in the winter. So we, we, we asked ourselves the same question. How, how do they do in the winter? Is it active in the winter because they stopped collecting? And is it, it, it is lower in May compared to October. So it loses activity over time. Um, can, can you take propolis? dissolve it into, make it into a paint and just coat the inside. Uh, so that's what Mike Simone did for his uh, research. He, he asked if you can take propolis and make it a tincture, right? And, and paint the inside of the colony instead of stimulating them to collect their own. Uh, you can do that. Mike did that and his research was a, a small period. He only, he painted the inside and he measured the immune system activity of bees after painting the colonies. And he noticed that the, he showed that yes, the immune system activity was lower, was quieter when the colonies were painted with that propolis uh, extract. But his research was only, uh, it took only maybe one week or two weeks. That tincture is in ethanol and it volatilized really quick. So we don't know how long that, that effect will take. Uh, it, it's possible that it only lasts for maybe a month, so you would have to keep painting. It's just easier to let them uh, deposit. And if they can select for resin, it's just easier to let them collect whatever they want instead of making it. Yes? Uh, RVs typically heavily propolize uh, frame contact points inside the hive, and, and are, are you suggesting that, that you need more propolis to get than what they're bringing in? It's a fairly heavy load that's in there. I mean, we really have to try at certain points of year to get things apart. And so are you suggesting that, that there's a threshold that has not yet been met, and you really need to, to add more to the inside than what they're doing naturally? I don't know what the threshold is. Um, it's a good question you have. A lot of people ask me that. And my control colonies, the colonies that do not have a propolis envelope, they did the same. They, they had propolis between the frames. We let them do what they do naturally. I mean, if they don't have the propolis trap. So they behave the same as the other colonies. They, put propolis between frames and um, try to seal two colonies if the, you have two colonies. So they did exactly the same thing. So we are comparing the propolis traps with what you see in the field, usually in your hives. And it seems like it's better when they have the propolis envelope. Um, I don't know what, if there's a threshold, what the threshold is. But it seems like, yes, they, they do need more. They need to have uh, that layer tr um, in the colony. Yes. So in the, in the study where you checked whether or not they selected for specific resins, did all those hives have the problems and in them? No. The, colon, the, the, the ones that we all, only uh, trying to see if they self-medicate. We did not have propolis in, uh, traps in any of them. The only effect there was the challenge uh, that they received. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering if rough cut lumber would stimulate propolis production on the inside. 
Yes, we have tried and we have had success with that. Uh -huh. it, it works well. Uh, I wish we had more of those. Uh, it seems to work really well. The advantage maybe, uh, and, and that's up to beekeepers, the advantage of having the traps um, is that you can scrape uh, at the end of the season and maybe let them collect fresh stuff. Uh, I don't know if lumber, if at one point they would just uh, stop collecting, but uh, we have used some of those and they work really well. The other thing I wonder about is it seems that a lot of the natural protections that people have been using against mites have been, you know, thymol and camphor and various aromatics like that. Did you look at all that anti-mite activity? We, we did. Uh, so the research that I will, uh, the results that I will show tomorrow, we did look at uh, vir uh, mite levels. Uh, we did not find any difference when they had the propylose envelope and when they did not. We, there was no difference in mite level. But there's one, one thing. Uh, the colonies we, that we use, uh, we started from packages. And packages usually don't have a lot of mites, uh, usually. So it could be the fact that those were young colonies, why we did not see, or it could just be that it does have, doesn't have an effect. So uh, I do not have an answer, but I, I, what we saw is that there is no effect. And from the energetic standpoint, I have to ask if the collection of resin is also taking a great deal of energy out of the system. Is it? Uh, well, it, it is a energy uh, demanding job. It's not as easy as collect po collecting pollen, but there's not too many foragers that will collect for resin. We think uh, the estimate is that there's less than 1% of total forage force that actually goes out and collect uh, resin. So there's not too many. And at this point of their life, um, their immune system is already really uh, reduced uh, and they maybe have two days of life when they start foraging. So I don't know if it makes a lot of difference whether they're collecting for something that is, requires a lot of energy from them or not. So, so from the standard of high, high energetics, it'd be far less significant than wax collecting. Uh, well, they, pro they produce their own wax, yes. Um, I don't know. I don't know for the energetic if 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 it requires less energy to produce wax or to collect propolis. I don't. I can't. I don't know the answer. But I would. When they're synthesizing wax, they're 13 days old, uh, roughly maybe 10 to 15 days old. They're younger. Um, I don't know how you could compare. Uh, what are they doing 10 to 15 days? Synthesize. They, they can produce wax. They can produce wax from the wax blends. Yes? Have the star studied the effects of people who are harvesting the propolis for medicinal purposes? How that harms the hive versus one that you wouldn't touch and you're growing the propolis and giving it there? Um, I haven't done anything with that. In Brazil, they produce, uh, they have a lot of colonies to produce propolis. Um, those colonies produce a lot of propolis, and they are, they're just, to, it, it's some, you, you point your production to whatever you want. If you want to produce honey, we'll kind of have your goal for honey. And they have bees, there are, uh, gen, their genetics is to produce propolis, and they just produce a lot of propolis. Uh, doesn't seem to harm the colony, but they produce tons of propolis, um, and it's just their genetics. Um, they collect a lot of resin. Did you know um, what he was saying about if you paint a tincture of propolis, does that encourage them to continue to produce more? Or? I don't think Mike uh, looked uh, on resin on um, propolis production after. You, you talking more like if you, you prime if you you prime that instinct that okay you need that. Um, I don't think he 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 measure. Um, I don't think so. He measured that, but we think um, 
One of the things that resin forgers are really good at is that sensing um, the, the tactile cues. So they can, so if you have a gap, they can sense that gap and they want to fill it. So I don't know if the, the smell would trigger them to collect, maybe it does, uh, but we think it's mostly uh, the text, so if the, the surface, if it's rough or smooth or if there's a gap or a hole. Uh, some colonies we even try to close the entrance hole with propolis. Um, Uh, so melt propolis with wax, and then you coat it. You could try. I'm not sure how that would stick to the to the wall really well. Bees are smarter than I am. I think they can do that. <laughs> I don't know if I. You could. I mean, it would be maybe a lot of work. Uh, but you might, you might be able to do that to maybe um, add propolis to your wax. You have just to be careful with some in ideas because you have to, to not go too far. I mean, we, propolis has antimicrobial compounds, but sometimes that if it's too much, it can be toxic. So, for example, bees do not eat propolis. And there's a paper that uh, they fed propolis to the bees as a way to treat American fowl brood. And they noticed that if it was highly concentrated, there was uh, an effect on the bee because it can be toxic. So you just have to be careful to not go too far. Uh, just understanding what they do doesn't mean we have to uh, overload them with it. Uh, so. Oh, thank you. Oh, just one more? Or? Oh, okay, thank you very much. <laughs>